Chapter 3 The Invisible Battle Having in the first chapter referred to the nature of the departure by man from the orderly course of a growth to which he was destined, and in the second suggested the signs, perceptible at the present day, that the growth will be resumed at a stage in terrestrial life, despite the interlude of temporarily debased conditions, far in advance of the terrestrial starting point. We must leave for their proper balance in this investigation of the inner springs of human history, the demonstration of the rich promises which rise above the mental horizon, and establish nothing less than the salvation of the world from its long misery, in order to return to the description of the initial period of error, for without an exact understanding of the whole force, action to which it was subjected, it is impossible to throw a full light upon all the mysteries of the subsequent human record which have baffled its students. Connected with those changes affected in man's exterior constitution, that overlaying by gross elements of the casings of his finer matter, which followed as reproof and as protection upon the lawless demonstrations of his free will, was the exposure of his system to a class of gloomy and disorderly forces which struck, as will be seen, at some of the interior layers of his organic existence, and which, having access to these by affinity of material degree, invaded him where invasion was well-nigh fatal. While the humane instinct of our time has revolted, both in and out of the churches, against the traditional hellfire doctrine, and while no lover of God or man could feel otherwise than that the assumption, on the part of men or bodies of men, in interpreting the utterances of divinely inspired teachers as limiting the love of the Creator for the creature to the degree implied by it, is nothing short of profanation. Experiments pursued by many investigators of our day into the forces present in the finer layers of the human system have demonstrated facts by the light of which the impressions recorded by writers of all ages about the spirit regions are both verified and corrected, and the confusion ceases which has resulted from reference to them in the sacred books of most religions and in the records of mental and moral efforts left by philosophers and devotees of every time. The statement of the whole of this subject is attended with great difficulty because it encounters a mental wave of incredulity, first on the part of those who, while they not only admit the existence of an invisible world peopled by intelligences, and cling with fervor to the dogma of a hell inhabited by devils, whose occupation is to tempt mankind, deny altogether that their human victims can be physically conscious of their attacks, and secondly, on the part of those who have set an arbitrary limit upon the human faculty of experimental investigation, and assert, a priori, that anything which might be felt by others beyond the boundary which they have thus fixed cannot be the result of genuine experiences, but must be the product of an unreliable factor, to which they have given the name of imagination, whose powerful agency, as a positive and active organic force, they admit, but which they refuse to examine, in defiance of the fact that the experiences they attribute to it not merely belong to a large class of living persons, but that they form the basis of all religions, have been corroborated by the most fervent natures at all periods of the world's history, and have ever given to society the stimulus to highest moral efforts. But in point of fact, the scientific narrowness of the day has been but inevitable and necessary transition occurring upon the first discovery of extractor methods of thought and experiment, and the reaction against the inexactness and confusedness of older methods. In the past, Man, in studying himself and nature, had to deal with a chaotic mass of sentiments, sensations, and observations, while he brought to bear upon them a comparatively immature rational organization and extremely limited physical appliances. The earth man has evolved but slowly, and as to the different parts of his nature, unevenly. In his last few generations, however, that intensification of which we have spoken in his inner growth his essential or moral growth in proceeding from his inmost towards the surfaces has shot its vitality forward upon those less remote planes of his organization which he terms his intellect. 
The secret foundation of his deep spirit, swelling mightily beneath, has fertilized the soils of his mentality. Hence we see at this day, with the promise of a higher moral condition than has yet been known, based on the increased sense of individual duty to mankind at large, a far more completely perfected intellectual and rational and inventive development that has ever been seen before. As yet, this one-sided growth has not had time, in the thoughtless vigor of its youth, to seek in all cases the reposting and regulating control of the deepest emotions, and a great number of the keenest thinkers of the time closed themselves against the investigation of the nature of their moral impulses, and failed, therefore, to learn how to establish the dependence of their mental and physical faculties upon them, while by suppression they so stunt their growth that they end in losing at last that which is the food of all true thought and reason. How slow, within their beasts as statingly emotions go, listen, the big vibrations swing beyond. Their scale of consciousness, for it is toned in limitations and may not receive such majesty of impulse, they believe that little scale sounds all that they can know of vibrant harmony in life below. But in the meantime, a class of seekers into the truths of nature arises, in whom the moral life grows already with an intensity deeply prophetic of the position that it seeks to assume towards the intellectual and physical activities. With these, the genius of all service and all thought submits to the dictation of the heart, but only because the heart has grown in them to a capacity which distributes through their minds an entirely new class of perceptions and through their bodies an entirely new class of sensations. But those who aspire to nothing short of joining in with the full current of the human evolutionary movement of their time find that they cannot avoid mastering, as a first study, the mode of motion of the affectional forces, they must enter a laboratory, eliminate conflicting conditions, submit matter to the operation of unimpeded natural activity, and frankly, accept the results. The laboratory is not smaller than the human race, and labor which loses sight of one of its needs is incompletely human. The conflicting conditions are all previously entertained opinions and acquired conclusions, all social prejudices, religious, philosophical, or skeptical convictions, and individual conceits, all ties of race, friendship, or family, where these are not wholly subservient to the life effort for truth in the interests of humanity. The matter to be submitted to experiment is that of each man's or woman's whole organic construction, the framework of body, mind, and those interior degrees voraciously conceived as spirit, soul, and the natural activities to be observed and registered are, all those which vibrate through the subtler or grosser divisions of the human system under the prepared conditions alluded to. All loves must first be cast aside, all things that men esteem their own, and truth be taken as a bride, who reigns supreme and reigns alone. She will not come for lower price. Her sweetness man can never know, who seeks this virgin to entice to share his love with things below. She does not ask for written creeds, no faiths her lover need profess, but she demands unselfish deeds, nor will be satisfied with less. Ah, she will gladly give her hand and fondly cling to his embrace, whose love is passionate and grand for all the stricken human race. But lest he should profess a love of sentiments that merely seem sincere intention he must prove. By making sacrifice supreme, then she will slowly lead him on by suffering and sharp ordeal, until a victory is won, and he begins to sense the real. Mainly by suffering he grows, and thus of insight gains the sense, till by experience he knows where his real faculties commence. When he, by effort of his own, the painful pilgrimage has trod, at last he finds himself alone with nature and with nature's God. He feels that sanity is one. He knows to him God is revealed. He basks in the creative sun, by clouds of darkness long concealed. He finds he lives and breathes and moves, with instinct never known before, as to his frame his mighty loves, its long-lost faculties restore. Through the calm pause of mental expectation which, according to all rational precedent, has thus been procured, 
The man, listening now at the door of his own nature for an answer to that question about the human truth, perceives a first repressible cry which vibrates along the atoms of his love form and claims the succouring of his fellow men. It will not be denied, and its passage into the system of the mind carries the perception that of all human needs, the first to be relieved are the lowest, because man is most helpless in his most external degree, and requires in the cleansing, clothing, and feeding of him the first supplements from his brother's stories. This is how those who have first cleared the way among their conceptions of duty for the free play of the strongest impulse of their most powerful affections find themselves inevitably prevented from disregarding the physical sufferings which teem in the world and are pressed to discover methods for the alleviation first of the least intellectual requirements of life. But it is soon perceived that for the divination of such methods of social reorganization as will suffice to trample out the distress of want and hunger, a higher class of intellectual faculty will be required and does evolve than has ever been applied to the simple investigation of the physics and sociology whose only legitimate function would be to minister to all the wants of man, a higher class of intellectual faculty, because mind must now take its place as the transmitting medium and machinery between the highest moral forces and the lowest physical need. But it is impossible to enter upon such an investigation of these purest impulses, and impossible to protect them against those which every being of ordinary mortality feels to be degrading, narrowing, or impure, without becoming open to perceive, through the intensification of the internal sensations, that subtle will, force of a distinctly personal character, opposes itself to the development of the true emotions, and seeks to impair their purity. In the more rudimentary form of such internal perceptions, or in those constitutions the more dense to spiritual sensations, the man is aware of this but dimly, and he describes it by stating his consciousness that the power of evil struggles in him against the power of good. In natures more sensitively developed, there is a distinct acquaintance with the personal quality in this opposition, a quality which corresponds to their own sense of will, individuality, and matches its strength with theirs. At this point, the investigators, even those comparatively obtusely organized, enter upon a very interesting stage of their experiment. They are making a will effort to cultivate the growth of their purest emotions and to suppress the growth of their lower ones. They have a dim suspicion that unseen beings seek to mingle impure elements of strength with those of their own baser nature, and they must verify the truth of this suspicion. Provided that they have been endowed with or have cultivated that habit of mind by which the conception of an ideal mortality, native to all human beings, has not been allowed to dim, they will prefer at this point to press forward with personal experiments, so as to discover a method of vanquishing the opposition, rather than repose upon any of the customary formulas suggested by the despair, the apathy, or the incapacity of those who have been overcome and they will not fall back upon the reflection that human nature is inevitably debased, or that original sin is an insurmountable obstacle, or that the highest aspirations refer to things incapable of realization. But they will continue to press forward in that spirit of persistence by which all labors profitable to the world have at all times been accomplished. In order to gauge the force, and discover the nature of the resistance to the spirit's labor for the life of its purest impulses, no other methods can be adopted than those used by physical science. A hypothesis must be entertained until verified or disproved by ascertaining whether or not the forces of nature work spontaneously in accordance with it. But let it here be said that every mind will not require to pursue for itself this process of verification. The vast majority will always be glad to rest upon the conclusions of isolated individuals whom they can reasonably suppose to be specially gifted for the pursuit of experimental investigations, else the division of labor in life necessary for the maintenance of society could never be accomplished. For without that quality of disposition by which thousands follow a teacher as sheep, a shepherd, 
the discovery and social incorporation of truth would mutually lack their complements. The evil arising from the following instinct are due to the still incomplete nature of the distribution of all moral forces throughout the globe and are temporary. The allusions now made to the manner of experiment will not be specially interesting to those people who feel that other life work presents itself to them than that of becoming spiritual scientists and that it is sufficient for them to embody the conclusions of these as they may recommend themselves more or less satisfactorily to their own fragmentary intuitions. The subject under discussion belongs practically to that minority who are pushed mightily from within to know for themselves what ails human nature. These find inevitably that there is no one hypothesis upon which they can practically combat with success the will effort to paralyze their will when it is set to annihilate the evil in themselves and to let the good live and grow. Many associations of thought, many prejudices of ignorance and of science, many conceits of fastidiousness, and the whole fashion of the surface tendencies of our generations make this hypothesis difficult to entertain for a sufficient length of time for its experimental verification. E. Pure C. Mauve, and without the recognition of that which the verification of this hypothesis persistently reveals, the simplest virtue current of the soul cannot be maintained in triumphant activity amidst the vice currents that seek to counteract it. There is a peopling by intelligence of debased quality, of regions outside of us, which have contact with the subsurface regions in us, in which reside our consciousness of personal morality, affectional impulse, and responsible will, the force and matter in such regions being in the same plane or degree of removal from the surfaces of nature, and the force and matter in us which we may term ordinary mortality, affection, and will. And the challenge to verify this fact in the manner that has been described is made even to those persons whose consciousness is of the most common quality and external type. The individual and will quality that meets them in the shape of resistance to every really lofty and impersonal aim in life proves itself to them by this, that by treating that resistance as a vital current from the mischievous or obstructive human intelligence moving in the elemental spheres of which their own spiritual degree forms a part, they can wholly overcome the resistance. By ignoring it, they remain under its control. The verification is de pretendre o a le seer. At the same time, it must be remembered that the ability to successfully overcome this resistance is only possessed fully by those who have, as before suggested, denuded themselves wholly of such mixed motives of action as are generally used to give strength of will and to supply the stimulus for high endeavor, but are based upon ambitions no loftier than the legitimized ambitions of common natures, the personal hopes and fears held out by their religion, or the self-righteousness which urges individuals to attain a character for preeminent virtue among their fellows. The investigator to whom the present experiment is suggested must be one who has shorn himself of this lower class of selfish stimulants to virtue, and who then for the first time becomes exposed to the terrific invasion of the unmixed vice current. For the numerous people of a type now increasing throughout the world, whose consciousness of the life processes of their different organic layers is constantly deepening, who feel the distinctive quality of the activities in the invisible nerve systems, as others only feel it in that exclusively called physical, for those in whom the consciousness of the external degree connects itself more and more deeply with the recesses of their structure, so that they see themselves in the inward fluid form, and can perceive also the fluid forms that dwell in the other inward regions of the universe. For these people, the life of today teems with experiences which throw full light alike upon the mysteries which science in its new minuteness approaches with increasing rapidity, upon whose vivid tragedies which to so many enact themselves on the stage of spiritual consciousness, and upon all the darkest problems of the past. It would be unnecessary to obtrude upon the minds of this day a request that they should strain their imaginations to discover what was the origin and nature of those forces of a human kind, 
to whose invasive activities the infant human race of this globe exposed itself at the moment of its earliest deviation from progressive evolution, except because, on the one hand, as has been described, man to this day finds his will organization attacked by invasive activities of exactly the same character, and finds his evolution impeded by them, unless he will recognize in order to subdue them, and because, on the other hand, the facts of human history from the time of its earliest records, which can hardly fail to be of vital interest to every intelligent human being, are no more explicable without this theory of the invasive activities than are the revealed facts of geological or ethnological science without such hypothesis as those of submerged continents or forgotten periods. For the class of minds whose conviction of the all-sufficing nature of their own impressions, or whose timidity in using the impressions of others, even hypothetically, has induced in them an exaggerated mistrust of all the experiences of mankind in the region of spiritual consciousness, one moment of clear personal perception, through the connecting of their superficial with their inner consciousness of the fact that men, termed, for a want of a more comprehensive word, spirits, have communion with them in the internal or fluid degree of their personality, would be of greater value than any testimony to that effect from a million of their most highly gifted visible fellow creatures. But to the majority of us, there is infinite interest as well as strength even in the knowing of what others have felt and perceived, and therefore any confirmation is full of value that may be given by historical record to our own discovery that the world around us and the world within us teem in those portions that our increasing blindness has named invisible with human beings of many varied powers and equalities. Although it becomes the more needful to sift by the increasing light of present mental and spiritual development all the facts contained in these perplexing and misleading records. Of the recorded impressions or perceptions possessing this collaborative value, it may be interesting here to refer to the more remarkable, so far as they suggest methods of explaining the most ancient problem of man's strife with evil, though it must be remembered that any explanation of the first impressions of disorderly will influences on our globe is of far less practical importance in the presence of struggle for higher life than the recognition of their actual presence here today and is, in fact, a branch of the subject of evolutionary history which will doubtless be superfluous to many people. The most rational and gifted seer suggests, from personal experiences so vivid as to be doubtless almost incomprehensible to the imagination of people who have passed through nothing akin to them, that the intelligent beings who from the outside first established a disastrous influence on this earth's infant humanity, were some of those who perverted will activity had brought about a physical dissolution of that previously existing globe in our solar system, whose untenanted orbit science has vainly endeavored to account for. The more ancient hypotheses have many of them acquired, by the lapse of time, an almost poetic interest, while a connecting thread of like thought runs through the differences in their form. The collection of traditions, commentaries, and illustrative anecdotes called the Talmud, by the study of which the exclusively Hebraic votaries of the Mosaic collections of writings elucidate and expound these, as to the simple statements in the book of Genesis concerning the apparition in the midst of the innocence of the youthful earth of a spirit of evil, the idea that this spirit was the incarnation of a power of infinite antiquity, human in form, and with a wife named Lilith, acting in opposition to the divine will, but does not attempt to define its origin. The selection from early traditions, given as the first chapters of the Mosaic books, fails even to attribute any human spirituality to the beast of the field who tempted the woman, but the New Testament, however, makes reference to an apparent familiarity of the minds of the people of that day with definite traditions on this subject, as, for instance, where Christ says of the devil that he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. And Jude, in his epistle, alludes to the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. 
the primitive teaching of Zoroaster through denying the future eternity of Ahriman, the author of all moral and material evil and of death, adopts the idea of his past co-eternity with Ormuzd, the creative god of the universe. The Chaldean system of worshiping, with its multiform and confused pantheism, alone among the larger divisions of the ancient faith, appears to ignore the presence in the world of evil as a distinctly antagonistic principle to the Divine One. The Egyptian, on the contrary, though its essential spirit was broken up into innumerable fables almost equally pantheistic, recognized with absolute distinctness, in accordance with this central idea, the lifelong effort of gods and men to subdue evil, even during the period succeeding the passage of the soul out of this world, but does not appear to suggest any cause for the presence of the evil principle in the world. But the idea that fragments of an antique conception of truth glisten amidst the inchoate mass formed by the whole body of early recorded tradition impresses itself more and more vividly upon the mind as we enter today upon the strife for which we have described the preparation and for which we make the claim that it is the wrestling of the man for the possession of the angel within himself, the maintenance of his growth condition. The daily strife in which he now embarks affords remarkable confirmation to the truth flicker he finds recorded of beliefs that the first influences of evil to which his race fell a prey in its infancy did not form a part of the original individuality consciousness of that race, but approached it from without, as from regions beyond its own prosper fear of activity, and through avenues which it inadvertently opened. For no sense becomes more clearly developed during this present strife than that the evil in his present self, which a new and high power of evolutionary growth is inducing him and enabling him to reject, is not a part of himself either as man or as race. So far as any religious system, ancient or modern, has held any nature in preparation for the easier growth of this perception of the extraneous nature of evil, which establishes itself at this maturing stage of humanity as an imperative one, so far has that system had a value to its votary or its victim. The study or acceptance of cosmogenies from the grossest to the most transcendental, is good in the measure in which food has been drawn from it for the recognition that the death principle so intricately involved throughout man's spiritual and physical frame is a foreign intrusion there. But such study and acceptance are unnecessary for those whose intuitive recognition to that effect transcends all necessity for their confirming it with the traditions of the past.